it's my great honor to be uh, you know, presenting to you today about lung cancer. And obviously, you you guys are lung cancer expert as well as breast cancer expert, since it is a uh, breast cancer society as well. Admittedly, I never be in Bangladesh. The closest is actually on my way to Bhutan. I stopped by in the airport, but I never get a chance to be uh, visiting Bangladesh physically. Hopefully, one day I will be there. And now this is my uh, disclosure. I'm on the board of director of this uh, four company, Hydrocynica, Hutchmat, Synomic, and Aurora. Now, I was asked to talk about the biomarker-driven uh, lung cancer. But let's take a look at the concept. What exactly does it mean by biomarker-driven? Now, this is a very simplified concept of uh, carcinogenesis. There's oncogene that promote the cancer growth, and there are also the tumor suppressor gene that prevent the cancer growth. So it's the loss of the tumor suppressor gene and gain of the oncogene that get into the so induction of apoptosis and the angiogenesis and eventually the cancer characteristic or metastasis. When we talk about uh, dry form oncogene, we're talking about a single gene that can change the behavior versus multiple oncogene. So a famous uh, scientist, uh, Dr. Weinstein, had defined this as a phenomenon by which cancer can obtain multiple genetic or epigenetic abnormality that remain dependent or addicted to one or few genes. So in other words, we need to have a single gene that we can target, and this single gene is the dominating gene that drives the cancer growth. The best known is actually ALK. ALK uh, itself you know, is uh, an implastic lymphokinase. Usually, it's actually quiescent in the adult cell. But due to a translocation in chromosome 2, then it becomes a fusion protein, and then this fusion protein will activate the cell growth. And this was actually first you know, described it, you know, uh, by Zolder in 2004, and that is due to the translocation that ALK fusion protein lead to the carcinogenic process and demonstrated in the mice that only with the M4L uh, uh, translocation, eight of a uh, mouse will grow the tumor. When you have the single M gene or single L gene, there's no tumor growth whatsoever. So this is the concept behind it, a transformation of a gene, of a mutation of the gene, such that it become a dominating uh, driver, okay? So this is the concept. So when we talk about management, this is the basic concept, to find it, to treat it, and then to treat the resistant. A lot of the research, and at least my research theme, is consistently along this path. So I've started off with the EGFR, and then I'm going to talk about ALK. Uh, hopefully, we'll complete all this in about 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll get a lot of time for discussion. <clears throat> now, first, finding EGFR. Now, I think quite sure, you know, all over the world, including, you know, Hong Kong, China, Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, uh, India, that EGFM mutation is a standard testing, you know, at the patient with the adenocarcinoma. So <clears throat> in a sense is that we have the obligation to find the mutation, but on the other hand, now that we move on, that whether we can monitor the diagnosis of lung, uh, EGFM mutation with the PASMA on an ongoing process, and at the time of resistant, we're trying to find a resistant T7M gene, and then after that, we may find a resistant to osmotinib. So the genomic testing of EGFR is likely now a continuous and dynamic process, no longer stay as just, you know, finding it in the beginning. Speaking of that, I don't have to talk about the tissue, but PASMA has been established quite nicely. Uh, due to one of these studies that we have done from the FASTX2, 224 paired sample, were able to find a sensitivity of 77% specific 96%, meaning that from the PASMA, we can pick up three out of four cancer. When it's positive, we're quite certain that it is uh, uh, positive and 96 per confident. So when you put the pool analysis, the sensitivity, you know, depend on what testing method is around 60 to 70%. And then specificity is persistently high. So in other words, that we can put it into the clinical practice. And especially when you come to the T7ICOM, because here you can do the biopsy then you can do the other tissue of PASMA. But when you have the progression of the TKI, then patient may not want a second biopsy. So therefore, PASMA become handy. So on the PASMA method, you got the ARMS method, 
as well as the digital PCR. And you can note that the digital PCR is actually more sensitive in general. And then with that, it had been established with some of the data by Jeff Osner, almost like five, six years ago, looking at the, from the oral study, that the sensitivity of the assay is actually advanced 86%, specifically about 70%. But with that, that means that, you know, for t 7 icom 70% of the specificity, you may still be having 31% of false positive. So the key question is that, what do they mean? Well, first of all, whenever you're passing positive, the chance of responding to uh, osmotinib is good, about 60%. And then the population that are plasma positive and tumor negative in this study, then you'll notice that actually a majority of them actually also have some response. So in other words, even though you're plasma uh, positive, but tissue negative, you still have the five patient uh, that's responding out of 18 patients. So at this moment, this is standard, is that first we test by plasma positive t M, and only it's negative that would go do the biopsy. So that was safe. Uh, biopsy for a lot of patients. So in terms of finding it, we have to find both EGF mutation as well as the T7A-COM at resistance if the patient had first generation drug. And for that, we're actually uh, using plasma in this first. A treatment, I'm sure you'll hear a lot about it. I'm not going to go over uh, the great detail, but to summarize the fact that ever since we were able to establish you know, with this article that the angel medicine that we can select by TKI, Arisa was the first drug that we used. We have multiple drugs. We have now three generation, Ertalit, Afretinib, Dicotinib as a second generation, also a third generation, but also had combined with chemotherapy, had combined with bevacizumab, combined with bevacizumab, and all this was able to show some degree of an improvement of progression-free survival, but then for over-survival, that's actually still a little bit questionable expect on the combination regimen. So at this moment, I think any of the single agent, any of this regimen is fine, but personally, I prefer single agent if there's no proven over-survival benefit. But to that effect, I want to just capture you on about the reason why I say that, it's the fact that when we try to do the study, we have first line TKI, and then we have treatment beyond progression, and then we have subsequent treatment and eventually supportive care. So we can measure the first line treatment with the progression-free survival. Maybe sometimes we measure progression-free survival number two by looking at the subsequent therapy, and then eventually over survival is the long term. But look at it this way, is that this part is controlled in a way that we know exactly what the patient do, and we can control what the patient do. But after the patient progression, um, then we have no control on subsequent therapy. So therefore, the eventual over-survival is relatively uncontrolled. So we cannot assume an over-survival benefit if it's a large degree that we know that it's helping. But it's a small degree, it can be due to a variation of the subsequent treatment. So when we compare well, a drug first line of semertinib with first or second generation TKI, now, there is always a subsequent therapy potential with, you know, with the osmotinib in here if you give first or second generation. So whether you can get it here or not will change your over-survival. So therefore, whenever you interpret this data, you have to interpret the subsequent therapy before you conclude whether there's a substantial difference in the over-survival. Now, how to move forward? Well, there have been some attempt to combine osmotinib with the chemotherapy like the 4 2 now, but then what's the chance of success in this regard? And then the, this is actually a data that come from Japan, looking at second eye situation, osomertinib and osomertinib plus chemotherapy. Now, the data is actually totally negative from Japan, probably because osomertinib is a, such a good drug and penetrate the brain. Addition of chemotherapy may not have too much impact on the final outcome. So we don't have the first line data yet, but we cannot be too optimistic that is going to make a big difference. And then there's also a 403 is combination with the map. This study is also ongoing at this moment. And the other study that you should look out for is a combination of amivantamab with losartinib. Uh, again, that this is actually was shown to some efficacy in a resistant situation. So they try to move it as a first line and they try to compare to the osimertinib and losartinib, which is the Korean make the third generation drug. So this study is still ongoing. I think it's going to take a few years before we get the result for this Mariposa study. 
So that is the treatment right now is that any of the first and second generation drug, I said first generation and third generation drug, of course, have potential benefit for the third generation. Then the key is that how do we treat the resistance for EGFR positive patient? Now, you can look at the pattern of resistance is variable. When you have the first or second generation TKI first, 60% of them may have the P7 ISO-M. And then you got about some HER2, a small number of MAC, and some small cell transformation. But once you go into the second line osmotelib or first line osmotelib, you don't have T7 anymore. There's a large number of unknown. And then you find out there is 15% of seven C7I7X, 5% of MAC HER2, and about 20% of the MAC amplification. So this is consistent. There is a degree of MAC amplification that has a cause of the osmotic resistance. So the question is that, uh, what can we offer the patient in addition or other than chemotherapy? I've, and I certainly know that uh, in Bangladesh that you have your own local version of osmotinib. So in other words, I, I can imagine a lot of the patient are actually receiving first night osmotinib. So this will be the key to the future management. Not now, but possible in the future. So first of all, C797S. Now, the binding site of osmotinib is a C797. So the transformation or a, a mutation in this will prevent from binding. So what has been being developed is an allostatic uh, development compound on the patient that is actually both the sensitizing mutation as well as the C797 positive patient. And then one of these drugs is called Blue 945 by Blueprint from Boston. And they were able to demonstrate in the cell line that there is actually uh, efficacy with a high sense of uh, IC50. Uh, this drug had just started on their phase of one study. So it will be a little while before that we can get the answer. <clears throat> the other one that was presented this year is to combine ambiventamab, which is a bispecific antibody of EGFR and MAC. Together with lasartinib, as I said, that it is a third generation TKI from Korea. Now, the data is actually preliminary. Uh, they combined it, uh, you know, after the patient osmotic failure and looking at the tumor response rate. Sample size is only about 29. However, the response rate in this small population about 36%, and the median progression free survival of 4.9 months. So they are a good number of responders, and then they seem to be durable. But very early data but interesting enough for us to pursue it further. One other interesting expert in this regard is the fact that can we have a biomarker? So they look into the potential of EGFR or MAC amplification since it's a bispecific antibody. So in theory, if you get protein expression, it may work better. So they only get 10 patients, but 10 patients who are actually um, so-called IXC positive, nine of them responded. And then, then the one patient, you know, the patient who are so-called the IXC negative, only one responded. So overall, I think that it is promising, but certainly this is too small a sample size for us to make a conclusion. So in future, osmotic failure, looking for IXC expression of EGFR, MAC, and consider I mean, Ventamap plus a uh, third generation TKI. Now, we want to talk about MAC because I show you about 15 to 20% of patients actually have MAC amplification. And then the two MAC inhibitors are actually so-called the approved for MAC uh, mutation mostly. So MAC, uh, so MAC exon 14 skipping or MAC exon 14 mutation. So both have been public in the New England Medicine in 2020. Now, but then the real study is not on this two drugs but uh, on a drug called sulfonitinib. Sulfonitinib is also similarly a MAC inhibitor that's actually being developed in China. And so they actually identify patients who are MAC uh, overexpressed it. And then the MAC amplification is defined as a gene copy number by FISH over five or MAC ZIP7 over two. And then there is an IXC two plus or three plus or by NGS. Now, once they amplified it, they got three R. One is the patient but one cohort is the fact that if the patient had prior third generation drug, and then part B2 is the fact that the patient had first or second generation TKI, and then T7-ICM negative. And then this is the no prior TKI, but T7-M positive. 
The COHOC D is similar to COHOC B2, except that the dosage of the drug subunitinib is lower at 300 milligram QD. So this is interesting finding. When you are osimertinib fail, and then you're mag and fight it, you continue osimertinib and add subunitinib to it, you actually have a response to 33%. Decent for the four-port curve. Now, when you are first a second injection fail, but then TCNM positive, you actually, you know, have some response, but this is not significant. But what's impressive here, even though your TCNM still negative, that means that you're not supposed to respond to uh, osimertinib. Then if your MAC amplified that you combine with the MAC inhibitor, you get a 65% and 62% of response rate. Sample size of 51 here and 42 here, almost like 100 patients that give you about 60% response rate. So I think it does mean something, you know, in a sense. So the other agent that was, uh, the, the other mechanism <coughs> of concern is the RB1, uh, is the uh, small cell transformation. So for that, you may have RB1 loss and TP53, but then you will see that, you know, the, most of these patients do not perform well. The progression-free survival is short and the over-survival is also short. So we should look for the patient with TP53 and RB1 loss in the beginning to look out for potential transformation. One other strategy that's interesting is to use the antibody drug conjugate targeting HER3. The drug is called U3-1402, and it is a new type of uh, so-called the IADC with a high payload and very strong linker. And so uh, attached it to the anti her antibody with a very cytotoxic drug, uh, that's the, uh, the 2-can. Uh, another approach, you know, is, uh, you know, when you look into this study, is look at the response rate. This actually already got published in uh, Cancer Discovery, 39% response rate and median progression-free survival 8.2 months. So this is a potential another ADC approach to treatment of osimertinib resistance. And then a randomized study likely will happen. It may happen either post osimertinib with chemo naive or post TKI and post platinum. That if you post platinum, then it's against the docetaxel. If it's post osimertinib, you can against the platinum. So this is actually being developed. Uh, I think the study will roll out very soon. And uh, I'm actually engaged in this study as well. So we may uh, start a study hopefully sometime in the near future. Now, of course, that another approach to the osmotic resistance is to use the uh, immunotherapy. So this is IMPA 150 using taxol, carbo, bevacizumab, and acetylucumab. And you can see that for mutation positive patient, <clears throat> the four drug, you know, a ABCP is better than taxol, carbo, bevacizumab, both in progression-free survival and over-survival. However, if it is again the adhesive with the chemotherapy, versus only bevacizumab with the, with the uh, chemotherapy, there's no difference. So there is potentially an additive effect of the anti-angiogenic drug together with the immunotherapy such as the uh, adizolizumab. Another study that had come out from China that shows similar thing, a mutation positive patient, failure TKI, that the immune uh, pdl one is called uh, uh, scintillimab. And then it's uh, about 160 patients versus the standard chemotherapy only. So this is chemo plus citinimab. And this particular study, oh, sorry. This is a citinimab together, uh, you know, with a um, bevacizumab uh, biosimilar. It's called IB305, but it's basically a bevacizumab, but then it's a biosimilar drug. So again, the four drug regimen versus this the chemotherapy alone, there is a median progression free survival 6.9 months versus 43, response rate 44% versus 25%. So this is kind of <clears throat> interesting, a China version of the monoclonal antibody against the pd one together with a biosimilar of the bevacizumab that were able to produce a similar kind of improvement. IMPA151 is another one, but uh, in Zeptaxo, they use the pemetraxate. This study may complete this year and hopefully result early next year. So I think we will have plenty of data to apply potentially immunotherapy uh, in patients uh, with the uh, EGFR osmotility failure. So that is EGFR. And let me just move on to the ALK a bit. Now, again, I think on the, 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 the policy of to find, to treat, and to treat the resistance. To find, 
it's a bit easier because that the standard is fish. As long as you've got good tissue, you can do a fish, which is expensive and labor intensive, but still doable and available in most places. You basically look for the speed signal. When you have the speed signal uh, attached to it of the ALK gene and M4 gene with the different color fluorescent stain, then once it's a speed in about 15% of cell, it's considered to be positive. Since this is a labor intensive, people have transformed it into a protein expression on the, uh, on the tumor, which is a uh, IXC in chemistry, as usually the ALK uh, do not get expressed uh, in normal cell. So with this, uh, we were able to establish as a standard test, but there come a problem. Whom shall we trust? Are we gonna use fish to design, IXC to design, or IXC to screen, fish to confirm, and then give the TKI? which is the best approach. So for that, we have to decide what happened to the patient that are IXC positive and FISH negative. So for that, we looked into the ADDIC study. As a matter of fact, we have about 13% of patients that are IXC. We have to remind you, the ADDIC study, we enroll patients by IXC, IXC, the protein expression only. And then retrospectively, we perform and look into the FISH. And then about 13% of it that are IXC positive, but then, is actually uh, 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 so-called the uh, fish negative. Another study, XO3, which is on another drug of uh, another TKI study, that and and started it. And so we actually enrolled it about 290 patients. But then we all also with respect to subject them for central testing by fish. And out of that, 43 patients actually were not confirmed to have ALK positivity by fish. So as a result, you're talking about 15% as well. So this is not the first time. So two study that, that demonstrated traded that there is about 13 to 15% of discrepancy. And the patient within this group doesn't do so well. So the response rate is lower. And then you know only about 20 some percent. And then also that the uh, complete response rate is lower. The key thing is that are they generally ALK positive? So that's why we performed the NGS on those patients. Out of the 39 patients, 35, they were able to do NGS. So out of this 35, interestingly, only 51, 51% of them actually have no ALK fusion. But what bothered us is the fact that out of this patient, 10 of the 20 patients who did not have ALK fusion also had positive response to the TKI. Now, what may explain? tumor heterogeneity. So probably some part of the tumor is ALK positive, but some other part of the tumor is not. So that gives you a very confusing picture. So there's no absolute. So we are actually moving on to try to look for ALK from the plasma by NGS. So the study that we've done is called the BFAR study. We use the plasma DNA to determine, and then if they are ALK positive, receive an ethnic, uh, BD. And interestingly, the response rate is very high with a referral brain back 80 to 90%. So this confirmed that we were able to identify the patient and confirm a high response rate. Uh, er too early for progression-free survival, but I'm quite certain that the survival will be quite long. So with that, we can use the IXC, also the FISH, or actually by plasma DNA to look for ALK. Now on the treatment, let me just put things in a capsule. Now, uh, the fact that we have number drug, Prisotinib from POFI 1014 that you're all familiar with, and it's approved and commonly used. But then Prisotinib was not really designed for ALK to start with, therefore the potency is not that high. Then we come to have about four <coughs> different second generation drugs. Seretinib with XN4, uh, that was actually approved, but limited by GI toxicity. <clears throat> and latinib is widely available, uh, approved by Alex and the JLX study, <clears throat> and this, which is the current standard. I'll go through more detail. And then there's brigatinib with alto first line. It's approved currently used. And sartanib is uh, uh, confirmed by XO3 study. It's uh, pending for approval in China, but it's not available outside China so far. Loratinib, which is the crank study, has approved it and actually the current standard. So first, the POFA, just to remind you, this is a very first study that Ben Solomon and I have done. ARK positive chrysotinib compared with chemotherapy looking for progression-free survival. Definitely is an improvement. But it's, it's good old time. This is <clears throat> back in 2014. 
But one lesson that we have learned subsequently is the fact that the patient had long survival. The median over survival, in, even in the control arm, is 48 months, meaning that four years. So this really obligates us to find the patient with the uh, <coughs> ALK and provide them with the ALK inhibitor. And so, because that they do have a very good survival. Now, accent for as I say, that is also compared to chemotherapy, but then it's a positive of 18 months of uh, 16 months of progression-free survival, which is nice, but then it's not compared to prosotinib. <clears throat> and then the drug has quite a bit of toxicity because the drug itself is a GI tract irritant. So the patient have diarrhea and vomiting. So we try to reduce that by giving 450 milligram together with food. And then with that, they greatly induce or reduce the GI toxicity. So that is actually, if you have to use serotonin, use 450 daily together with food. Now, but then the real decision is actually on this three, because you know, when you get something that's toxic, you try to use something that's not so toxic. So we have alatinib, loratinib, and brigatinib. So the question is that how best to choose? So I'm going to help you to look into this whole thing objectively together of the free drug from the data set. Now, so first of all, what's the primary endpoint? The primary endpoint is the um, investigated uh, PFS, but then they also capture the BERC, the independent uh, result as a secondary endpoint. The other two studies do it the other way, using BERC as a primary endpoint and investigate as a secondary endpoint. It doesn't really matter. Honestly, there's no significant difference uh, between one or the other, as long as you, you compare in a similar manner, apple to apple, orange to orange. So it doesn't really matter which study to use what. The other important thing is how to stratify. Now, there is the ECOG, RACE, and CNS, MAT, Crown is Athenicity, and CNS. He is prior chemotherapy and CNS because in ELTA they allow chemotherapy. But the key is here CNS, because bring is so common in ALK. So we need to know the CNS status. So in all three, they use the CNS as a stratification factor. So that's no difference. So the data was first presented in 2017 and then confirmed it on the long-term follow-up in 2020. At that time, there is a hazard ratio of 2.47 and the median was not rich. But then 36 months later, the median was actually rich at 34.8 months. This is probably one of the longest progression-free survival I've ever seen before that. And then about 40% of patients patient are progression-free at the end of four years. So that is an impressive result. And then using the outer first line, brigatinib, you also got similar that you can see that and the <coughs> brigatinib R, uh, you have the 24 months is by Burke, but then you had approximately 29 months if it's actually by investigator. So the 29 and the 34, I would just say they are similar. And it has a ratio of also the same, 2.43. Now, but then for the CRAM, it's a bit exceptional. The has a ratio of 0.28, and that is not reached yet, but then the control arm is the same. So the question is that, has a ratio of 4, 0 0.48, 0 0.28, 0 0.49, 38 months and 24 months are not rich. Can we just say that this one is better? Probably not, because a hazard ratio, you cannot really compare hazard ratio from one study to the other. We can only say that all these drugs are better than chrysotinib, but we can't say that anatinib is better or worse than loratinib or better or worse than uh, uh, brigatinib, because there's no comparison between the three drugs. So one other important aspect to know is the time to CNS progression, because that the drug itself has to penetrate the brain, and then you can see that it's significantly better with anatinib compared to chrysotinib, 9.44% in the first year with anatinib, but about 41% with chrysotinib. So that is a significant discrepancy in this regard. And you see the same thing with Crown, it's about 2.8% in one year and about, uh, uh, about 32% uh, in uh, chrysotinib. Uh, so both norotinib and the um, anatomy have been able to show a very high CNS efficacy. But then one other thing that's noticing is that in the Crown study, they actually report a high number of complete response. Now it's tricky because the complete response also depends on the location and the size, and we don't have that information. 
But complete response rate of 61% in the patient with non-mesural disease is about 71% for patients with the mesural disease in the baseline. Comparing to adaptinib in the ADEX study and brucatinib in the l first line study, the complete response rate is about 45 and 38 and 37 and 11. So whether that is translated into a clinical, meaningful clinical uh, practice, can, can you ask her to meal? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so now let's look into the ADEX study over survival, which is now mature after almost like five years. Then we actually at five years, you can see that 62.5% patient of patients still alive. Now, I think to me, it's quite historic. Um, you know, I think I'm old enough to work with most of you that the median, the five-year survival rate for stage four lung cancer was probably approximately about less than 10%. But now we're talking about 63% with the use of the, uh, of, with the anatomy in this case. So I think there's a major progress in this regard. And we don't have the data yet, but I think they will be equally impressive uh, from Crown and Alta 1. Toxicity. Uh, compared to anatinib to crisotinib, there are mild. You got some nausea and vomiting, you got some ALT increase, but all those are mild and well tolerated. And also, actually, portfolio is wise, it's actually better than crisotinib. And then, the alpha first line is also not too bad. You got a little bit of pneumonitis, but it's not too bad once you use the dose escalation. And then, again, the grade 3 4 is actually minimal in the brigatinib as well, compared to the crisotinib. And loratinib is slightly different. They got some special feature, which is the hypercholesterolemia. And they are actually quite significant. You get a almost like 15 to 20% of grade three, four. This is actually quite high. I will just show you in just a moment. You also have the other problem with a bit of weight increase, mostly due to fluid retention. And you may also have some neuropathy and cognitive effect. So that is actually uh, the side effect that was not present in other second generation TKI. Now, when you say how, how significant, when you say cholesterol high, grade 3, 4 is over 400 and 500. Now, translated into the SI unit is about over 10. Grade 4 is over 12 or 13. So 10 of grade 3, you can see that the hypercholesterol, 15% of the patient actually get over 10. So I think that's substantial that we have to worry and also we have to control well. Last but not the least, let's talk about how to treat the resistance. Now, different from the EGFR, the ALK have multiple resistance sites. You can see that there is the common one, G1202R, and also the L1196. And also there's a 1171. So all these are potential resistant after you use the first or second generation TKI. But interestingly, if you use a second generation drug like the uh, anatinib brigatinib, you're more likely to get the G1202R. Now, why is that? It's because of due to the uh, stress effect. So when you have a more potent drug, the only the so-called the prevailing tough gene survive, and that turned out to be G1202R that's resistant to anatinib and brigatinib. So this is the patient with the so-called the post anatinib uh, failure. Uh, the data come from CSR in 2019. And you can find that the G12RR is the most common, followed by I1177I insertion and L1196. So these are the three most common ones with post anatinib. And then even post loratinib, what do you see? You also see similar thing. And then you will find that that's actually more patient with multiple gene uh, mutation. And you still see 1196 and also 1202R. So the question is that apart from chemotherapy, what else can we do? Well, that comes to the potential fourth generation drug that can target the L1196 and 1202. And then uh, this is actually the drug that's called TPX0131. This is only preliminary data from last year AACR. Then you can see the IC50 is actually very low, okay? As compared to the other uh, so-called second generation drug. And then the, the you know, cell line uh, study, as well as the animal study, that you can see that there is actually significant improvement with the TPX0131. Uh, uh, and then they just rolled out their first phase one, two study uh, in April of 2021. So it is hopefully by end of this year, we may see some early data with this potential fourth generation uh, TKI. So let me just summarize for you that we have to find to treat 
and to treat the resistance. So UGFR, we can probably integrate possible DNA into a platform either in initial diagnosis, in monitoring, and especially looking for T-sub and ICLM mutation. ALK, the standard is IXC and our fish, but then there's a discrepancy for which you may want to use the DNA, uh, the NGS, to look for the, uh, the, 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 uh, the translocation. And then the plasma DNA is actually available for NGS purpose. To treat the multiple first line option, including single agent, first, second, and third generation, although third generation had the benefit of the improvement uh, over the first generation in terms of CNF penetration. And then combination, it worked, but it doesn't seem to have a significant impact on oversurvival. Now, ALK, I think it's important to look at the long progression free survival. Any of the second and third generation drugs should be considered. I think the chrysotinib probably doesn't have the role due to the lack of CNS efficacy and the shorter progression free survival. And then for the loratinib, there's a slight improvement of the complete response in the brain. Now, resistant for UGFL, T790 is the is dominant one if it's the first or second generation. But then once you come to the post-osmotinib, it's quite complex. But then we have a number of measures potentially talking to it. Last but not the least is the ALK, we should be mindful of the G1202R and then the L1196M, and then for which we may be looking forward to the future of the fourth generation TKI to target it. So that summarized my uh, presentation uh, to share with you my thought on these two important topic. Also, I want to, sh uh, tell, uh, to, to share with you is that this is the year of the tiger. And then the, the tiger means energy and, and, and uh, adrenaline and power. And I looked around and actually, I, I, I actually uh, learned a little bit about Bangladesh is the fact that you have a very famous team called the Bengal Tiger uh, in the cricket. And I wish the best to go Tiger Go. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your excellent talk, and it really enlightened us on the management of non-sponsored lung cancer, particularly EGFR and ALK mutation positive. So before we go to our panel of discussion, we have a couple of questions in our chat box. We'd like to address those questions. So uh, with the permission of Tony Moxa, we are taking the question, sir. Mm. Okay. So first question is from Professor Dr. Shibhashish. And his question is, in Bangladesh, osimertinib by default is first line of therapy in EGFR mutated lung cancer due to cheaper generic available. Hence, mm -hmm. on progression, what is the option? <clears throat> right. So I've, uh, yeah, I mentioned that briefly in my talk that I expect osimertinib to be the standard treatment. So it really depends whether you do have the NGS capacity to look for the resistant mechanism. Now, if you do, I think it was advisable to uh, to look into looking for the potential of uh, MAC amplification. And then because right now there's a MAC inhibitor available. Okay. So that will be uh, one potential if you want to, you know, uh, uh, look further for resistance mechanism. But if you don't, then the standard has to be chemotherapy. Right now, the role of uh, chemotherapy is still debatable. There is uh, the randomized study on chemo plus chemotherapy versus chemo is still ongoing. So at this moment, the major standard is still chemotherapy, nothing too fancy. I sometimes use IMPAR 150 afterward, after the standard alimbic carbo, then I may use uh, IMPAR 150. Uh, but then again, that you know, in my locality, we have NGS surface, so we do uh, look into the NGS, like the so-called the resistance mechanism, on a regular basis. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next question is from Dr. Arman Reza Choudhury, and his question is, if both EGFR and ALK are positive, how to sequence the treatment? Right. Another important question. Uh, this happened approximately about 3 to 4% of the patient with the EGFR mutation. This was quite well reported by uh, Wu Yilong from China. <clears throat> so uh, I approach it in a common sense, in a sense is this, is that uh, which is a cheaper treatment? Now, EGFR treatment is a lot cheaper than ALK treatment. I do not like to start off with, uh, with both drugs because number one, it adds on to the cost. Number two, it adds on to the toxicity. So I will start off with EGFR uh, TKI. And then after two months, I will do a, another scan or particularly a PET scan to look for the residual disease. Now, if there's minimal residual disease, nothing left, then I would just go on 
with the GGFR TKI because the patient may likely have long-term benefit. If the patient still has some active disease at one or two sites, I may just do radiation. And only at the time of recurrence, I will be biopsy to see whether it is the ALK activity or whether it's GGFR and switch the drug. So I would do six sets rather than two drugs together, uh, you know, because that they're really a very limited data on the efficacy of the ALK inhibitor and GGFR uh, inhibitor together. And then uh, liver toxicity is a major concern. Uh, thank you, sir. We have a couple of very uh, important, interesting questions from Professor Mofazal, sir. Uh, let me read all these three together. So his first question is, what is your practice in case of metastatic adenocarcinoma lung with EGFR positive uh, disease to start with TKI on first hand or to start with chemo to reduce the disease bulk and then to go for the TKI? His first question. And the second one is, Recently, FDA has decided that for approving a molecule based on Chinese study must be substituted by additional study. Your comment on this? And the final one is in real life practice. Okay, we why don't we start with the two questions? Because I forgot okay. the third one. <laughs> All right, let's do the first question. Uh, for stage four disease, okay, and DJ positive, there's no doubt that we should start the TKI first. Chemotherapy. Uh, does not add on to the dose or to the to the bulk disease reduction, because if you look at most of the study, the time to for, time to response for all the TKI study is about seven to ten days, and chemotherapy actually cannot reduce the tumor as fast as the TKI. So the argument to use the chemo to reduce the tumor load for TKI is all total bullshit. The, that is an excuse made by the people who cannot get the EGFR TKI result fast enough and they want to start chemotherapy first. So I personally do it like suggest like this. If you got a patient, you know, who is actually uh, re you know, e relatively stable, and then you can wait five to seven days for EGFR mutation, you should wait for EGFR mutation before you start on the TKI. There's the only occasional patient that are critically ill and you don't have the EGF result that you want to start chemotherapy, that may be acceptable. But trying to use it as a standard practice to start chemo first and then give TKI later, that's totally again the standard uh, international recommendation. So that's the first uh, question. So the second question, study that's only done in China, should it get FDA? Uh, so when we come to FDA, should they get additional study? Now, so that the best example is on the reason uh, Lily submission to FDA of a immunotherapy called um, uh, uh, cystinotunumab, a NTPDL1 that is made by a company called, uh, called Innovan. So that study was done. Uh, that is the Orient study of 031 that's strongly positive, just like the checkmate, uh, just like the uh, uh, Kino 189. But then this submission was taken to the FDA in the ODAC. 14 vote versus one vote to reject it, okay? So in other words, FDA had made it very clear if the data is purely done in China, they may not accept it. Well, I think it's relatively fair in the sense is that when you have an FDA um, United States done study, when they go to China, they still require a bit of Chinese data before they approve it. So I think when you have the data that is actually purely done in China, they should have some bridging data in the United States before FDA can consider it. So uh, I, I think that it will be the, the future trend, you know, in the sense is that uh, any drug that before FDA approval, they may have some Western data. Third question. Uh, the third question is in uh, real life practice, we don't get as good result as uh, the studies teach us. Uh, what is the reason, pharmaceutical or what? Very you are talking about the TKI? Yes, TKI. Hmm. Now, this is a very tricky question. Uh, I don't have the data, but and I don't have the information is that whether the Bangladesh osimertinib is the same as the AstraZeneca osimertinib. I think there could be potentially pharmaco uh, pharmacology vigilance. Uh, I, I, but, but since I don't, I have not done any background research on the, your product, so I'm not going to say. But again, <clears throat> what happened is this, is that uh, osimertinib is a very potent drug. 
even though it get lower dose, you may have some response. If you look at Pasiana's paper, it, but it, the standard dose is 80 milligram, but even when you go to 20 milligram, you may still actually have some response. However, the duration response is not as long. So potentially, the so-called the, the pharmacovigilance is the fact that whether the, the drug that is being produced that is a consistent dosing. So that part, I think you may have to uh, deal with your local pharmaceutical company to look into the so-called the pharmacovigilance. Um, okay, uh, there is another question from uh, Ariful Hawk, and his question is, if IHC is positive or negative for ALK mutation, should we recheck by FISH on a regular basis? Right. I personally don't. And let me explain why. So if you do it, you may have about 15% that's negative. But then even if it's negative, it may still have a small a chance to respond to the TKI. So as long as the drug is safe, I think it's acceptable because 85% of the patient will be double positive. So you don't need to check it. And then only 15% that's discrepancy, but they may still have about a 30% chance of responding to it. So I think I would just go by the clinical practice, the clinical response to the TKI. And then, so I personally will just uh, start the drug by IHC. Only if the patient not responding well, then I may send a sample to for NGS to make sure that the patient doesn't have other mutation. So I see it's good enough for me to start TKI and they, if they're not responding, I'll do NGS. Thank you, sir. Um, maybe we have one more question left. Uh, T790M mutation lung cancer with brain mats, progression of the osimertinib, what should be the next approach? So the progression on osimertinib. Right. Okay, it's a tough one. So uh, osimertinib, basically uh, is one of the best CNS penetrating drug. And then the, if the patient already had progression uh, on, the, on the brain mat, then I will look at a few things. If it is a surgery or small progression, I will do SBRT. And because that will work well. Now, the, uh, if the patient has multiple brain mat progression, then SBRT or whole brain RT may not be possible or not helping. Then you have to say that what are the systemic therapy that may help? Uh, there are scanty data. There's scanty data that sometimes the addition of uh, bevacizumab together with the TKI may improve the CNS penetration, but that is not a well-proven study. Ooh. However, there are some efficacy data. So that is one possibility of consideration. And number two is again back to the pharmacovigilance. It's about the dosing issue. So if, if you're not certain about the dosing, you know, if, if you have your local formula that you want to say that, hey, is it safe enough to double the dose? I mean, just increase the CNS penetration. But then uh, that for the astrocynical product, there's no data suggesting increasing from 80 to 160 would make a difference for brain mat. But then if the patient has leptomeningeal mat, 160 milligram may actually perform a little bit better than 80 milligram.